Roya Hakakian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you again. So, um, you know, these protests in Iran have a long tradition, right? We had uh, a protest movement at the end of the 2000s. We've had protests against the theocratic regime repeatedly since it took power in 1979. Um, what is special, if anything, about this moment? Why do you think, if you do, that there is more reason to hope for a fundamental challenge to the regime now than there has been in the past? Right. Um, I think there is, and I think this is fundamentally different. And here's my thinking. There have been many, many demonstrations in Iran since 1979. Uh, there, there have been a few important peaks um, in the movements that have come before. Uh, the most significant one came in 2009 uh, in the semblance of what we came to know the, as the Green Movement. It was a reaction to uh, the election of uh, President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and um, people had at the time um, voted for uh, his rival, who was Musavi, uh, Mir Hussein Musavi. And Mir Hussein Musavi was basically a product of the Islamic Republic uh, thinking and infrastructure himself. And he had been, in fact, a prime minister in Iran before. So, um, he was running this time in 2009 as a reform candidate. And, and a lot of the youth in Iran had invested in him and were excited about his the possibility of him, him becoming a president. And then suddenly, you know, the elections uh, didn't go the way that the public had thought. And, you know, for many reasons, everyone believes um, that it was rigged. Um, and so in the aftermath, people took to the streets in you know, in great numbers. And the fundamental slogan at the time was, where is my vote? Now, to me, the notion of where is my vote implies that the nation, the protesters are in conversation with the system, with the regime, that they believe that if they make a reasonable demand, you know, civilly, politely, um, they will get a response because to them, the regime still has a sense of legitimacy that if they do all the right things, which at the time meant take to the streets, you know, express your dissatisfaction with the situation, ask for a recount or whatever, then then you will get um, from that regime what you deserve. And that didn't happen. Um, in fact, the opposite happened. A great deal of violence was carried out. Um, in my view, a huge generation. Um, marked another departure, another wave of immigration of Iranian activists and, and, uh, and civil society intellectuals who took, um, uh, who took to the streets and then were, um, were jettisoned out of the country once again. Um, and and they, you know, they changed the landscape of the diaspora. But, um, but that was a huge moment. And, you know, hundreds of people were killed you know, many more executed, uh, tortured in prisons. You know, these are very traumatic moments. And then that... Uh, and and just, just just to jump in there, so, so, so I guess what you're implying is that at the time, this was an important protest movement, an inspiring one, um, but it actually was accommodationist in a certain kind of way. Uh, its, uh, you know, goal was to uh, have the winning candidate in the presidential elections reinstated. Um, and this was not somebody who was uh, a radical opponent of the regime. It was somebody who came from within the regime. It was somebody who had been allowed to run by uh, the supreme religious leaders, as, as some people would 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 not be. Um, and the demand effectively was, hey, count our vote, right? Like recognize, um, uh, you know, live up to the things you promised from within the political system. And so... Uh, it was obviously a, a political challenge to the regime in certain kinds of ways, but 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 I take it you're saying it was quite a limited challenge that didn't mean to subvert the basic foundation of the Islamic Republic uh, 
of Iran. And so uh, I'm guessing now that what you're trying to say is that that's different today, that the nature of a protest today is, is, is a lot less accommodationist and constitutes a more fundamental challenge to the founding principles of a theocratic regime than the Green Movement did in, in 2009. Precisely. So I think 2009 was the moment when uh, the nation said, okay, we started a reform movement with the rise of Khatami in 1997 to power. And by 2009, it had been over a decade that we had given uh, the re reform movement a shot. And when that didn't work, when, you know, when somebody as um, within the regime as Musavi couldn't get to presidential office, then I think that was the end of the reform movement for the people inside Iran, because um, they did everything they possibly could, you know, through electoral participation, through, um, you know, campaigning, um, through all the means that was available to them to get this guy uh, to become president, and they couldn't. And I think that's when uh, the idea that reform could have a possibility uh, ended for the people in Iran. So what are the qualities of this time around, of this round of movements? It's that the conversation with the regime, unlike what it was like in 2009, has ended. There is nobody on the streets who is saying, you know, eradicate uh, the morality police, or there's, there are no demands that these protesters are making from the system. Uh, and the only thing they're saying is, the dictator must fall, um, death to the dictator, and we're done with you. And I think that that's what, in my view, um, whether it succeeds or not, um, makes it a revolutionary moment. Um, they're not going home. The, they're making demands that the regime cannot meet, uh, nor can the regime uh, send these protesters home and, and uh, quell the uprising, uh, the movement. So I, in, in that way, I think it hugely qualifies as a revolutionary moment and in, in that end to the conversation that was going on over uh, 10 years ago with the system and also in other manifestations, which is um, uh, in, in calling uh, death to the supreme leader now and death to the founder, which is Ayatollah Khomeini, um, who you know, established this new system in 1979. And I think these are um, ideas that tell us that the people are fundamentally done with a, a non-secular system. But that's fascinating. Um, when I see protest movements in, in dictatorships, I'm, I'm always a little bit torn, right? Because I wish them the best of luck. Um, I identify with them uh, from a distance and so far as that's appropriate. I, I have have biggest, uh, you know, admiration for people who are risking their lives in the street for their ideals. But of course, it's also tempting to think it's not going to work out in the end. And a lot of people will be arrested. A lot of people will be killed um, without having achieved the, the valiant goal they're, they're, they're fighting for. Um, and I must admit that at the beginning of his protest, that's been a little bit my impression. Um, I've been struck, though, by how long these protests have now been going on and, and how broad the support for them has been among you know professions like teachers, uh, for example. And so, uh, you know, what is it that has allowed these protests to persist for such a long time? Uh, why is it that the Iranian regime, even though it has obviously used uh, considerable force um, to quash these uh, protests, has not gone all out. It has not used all of the force at its disposal in order to crush uh, these protests completely. Um, uh, uh, you know, shifting from the very interesting qualitative case you've made for what's different about the demands today and 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 how that makes it qualify as a revolutionary moment. What about the simple sort of uh, hard facts of, of 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 how strong support for them, for the protests is and uh, 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 and why so far it has um, uh, you know been able to restrain the regime from 
quashing it in a most violent way? What what, what explains that longevity and 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 that deeper base of support? Um, I just want to uh, offer a qualification. I don't think the regime uh, hasn't prevented itself from using violence. I think what's happening is that um, the protesters haven't provided the opportunity in big cities, especially in Tehran, for the regime to attack them in the way that they did in 2009. So part of the reason why we don't see you know, a million man march is because if everybody takes to the streets, then you know, they'll bite the bullet and they'll bring out the tanks and you know, the big guns and, and attack them wholesale as they've done before. And I think part of the reason we keep seeing you know, uh, uh, these small protests, but, but throughout the city and throughout the country, um, it has uh, guaranteed their endurance. Uh, so, but but in every other way, that that's should... very interesting. So, there's a kind of tactical uh, innovation here, in a way, to say we're we're going to spread all over. We're only ever going to assemble in relatively small numbers, and that makes it harder for the regime to to attack us. That's that's interesting, and in some ways counterintuitive. Absolutely, absolutely, and especially given uh, the past experiences. So, I think it's very um, uplifting to know that they are taking all the proper lessons. Um, but in places where they have been able to, um, you know, uh, deploy every amount of violence against large crowds, they have. They've done that in Baluchistan. Um, they killed, uh, you know, over 90 uh, worshippers at a Friday prayer in Zahedan uh, about two months ago. They've done so in Kurdistan. So when there has been the opportunity for them to actually go into a city knowing that the city itself is against them, and by the way, those are border cities that are far away from the center and there are less cameras, less, less coverage, then they have been entirely brutal and they have used all the violence. And by the way, um, we're setting aside all the abuse and torture and uh, all the other things that they're doing to 16 plus thousand uh, uh, people that they've arrested in prisons at the moment. So we are leaving all those out. Um, but let's see why this is enduring. But let what me let me let me push you perhaps for a moment on that point, but, but before we get to the broader question, because um what you're saying does seem to me to suggest that the regime is scared for what the impact of large scale open violence in uh, the cities in the, in the in the center of Rwan would be. So it's one thing to say, uh, you know, we're, we're in a city where ethnic minorities um, are concentrated and that's something that perhaps, uh, you know, if there's violence there, we can sell it as, you know, quashing a kind of ethnic rebellion and we're uh, not going to see as much of the mainstream of Iranian society be shocked by it and think of regime potentially um, but but it seems as though there is a kind of PR consideration, which is, well, hang on a second. If we start openly killing people in the center of Tehran, um, uh, that may actually push public opinion against us even more strongly. So to be clear, I'm not crediting the regime with any kind of moral scruples here. But I guess as a political scientist, one of the things that I'm interested in understanding in this situation is how strong the cards of a regime are or how strong the regime seems to think its cards are. And if a regime is saying, look, in these peripheral cities, we can actually crush protests in this really openly violent way. But in much of Iran, we can't risk doing that. That makes me think that they're worried about what would happen if they tried, about whether some troops might then defect, about whether... Uh, you know, that would become the occasion for even broader mass mobilization uh, in response to it. And, and those are the kinds of moments when regimes fall. So as somebody who really knows very, very little about Iran, one of the reasons why I'm pushing on this point is that I'm sort of trying to understand how many cards does the regime hold and how confident is it? And, and what you're saying actually makes me think that the cards may be be weak, or at least the regime feels constrained in these kinds of ways. Um, uh, and that might open up, might open up the possibility for the kind of split between hardliners and softliners, between people who are loyal to regime and people who say, hang on a second, 
perhaps we're not willing to use that much violence in order to uh, uh, protect the current social order, which does actually allow revolts and rebellions to to succeed. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's possible. I think it, that's one possibility. Certainly, they don't um, want any um, more bad publicity than they've already got. Um, but I think the other is that uh, they may very well have trouble uh, recruiting from their own to uh, to carry out large scale large scale violence in major cities. Um, there are reports of you know, just sheer exhaustion on the part of the riot police and other uh, military personnel that they have. There's also, um, you know, rifts within um, the military apparatus. There was a report uh, that came out as a result of a major hacking operation um, that revealed something close to 115 um they had arrested something close to 150 military personnel who were sympathetic to the protesters. So it's it's not simply a consideration on their part. I think it's also a consideration um, for uh, how much they can do without creating a riot from within their own ranks. So I think that's, that's another uh, issue that's going on. But uh, going back to, to the earlier point about why it's enduring, um, some of it is captured entirely in the fundamental slogan that defines this movement, which is woman, life, liberty. And I think in some ways, this is the parallel idea as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, so I think what there is, is a recognition that life itself really has uh, no ability to thrive under the circumstances in Iran today, that that there is no sense of future um, that the youth uh, have about, you know, what what is on the horizon for them. And I think the sense of futurelessness um, is a huge motivation. And the second thing is, you know, and you hear it in the slogans uh, coming out, is that we're not leaving this country. We are here to overthrow you, but we are not going to vacate the premises, so to speak. And and I think there is a deep recognition that if every generation keeps um, going outside of Iran, you know, leaving, going into exile, then who's going to remain here to change this system? And I think there is a a real devotion to the idea of sticking it out in order to uh, bring about major change. Um, and I think everybody who has been underestimating what's happening uh, is doing precisely the mistake that they made uh, at the start of the war uh, against Ukraine in February of 2022. Um, it, I, there were very few people who were forecasting the Ukrainians to resist, um, never mind succeed. Um, and there, the overwhelming thought was that the Ukrainians were going to be overpowered by the Russians and Russia was going to you know, march in and, and take over the whole country very quickly. Um, and, and I think Iran is proving to be uh, behaving similarly, that they are committed, that they recognize that this is a difficult moment for the nation, but as long as they don't uh, put themselves through this crucible, that there will be no, um, no future to keep them in the country, no future to look forward to. And therefore, I think it's continuing. One of the strange ironies about the history of Iran over the last half century is that, uh, you know, very quickly after 1979, you had uh, the consolidation in power of this deeply theocratic regime, which is trying to use all of the levers of the state to indoctrinate people to be, you know, deeply devout um, from the way that it runs the, you know, elementary and secondary school system to the university system to television and public media to, of course, you know, laws like the mandatory hijab. And yet in what I think is a kind of amazing testament uh, to the human striving for liberty, uh, 
um, the actual changes in society seem to have, at least in some respects, gone counter to those intentions. Um, so uh, at this point, I believe a majority of women in higher education, I'm uh, sorry, at this point, I believe a majority of students in higher education are young women uh, rather than men. Uh, according to some uh, recent polls I have seen, uh, over 70% of people uh, in Iran disagree with the uh, compulsory hijab law. Uh, there's been a real secularization in Iranian society. So only about 30% of uh, Iranians now say that they uh, pray five times a day, a figure that is lower than it was in the past, as I understand it. Um, and, uh, you know, a good half of the Iranian population openly say that they want to live in a secular state. So, you know, tell us a little bit about the nature and the shape of Iran's society today and, and help those of us who don't know much about the country understand that amazing contrast between a regime that for 50 years has used all of these resources to entrench religion and a society which has actually secularized to what seems, at least from those figures, a remarkable extent. Right. So I just want to add um, one qualification to one of the statistics that you offered. Um, it's true that the overwhelming majority of uh, people, students in higher education, are women. But I just want to say that this is not happening because of the regime. It's happening despite the regime. Um, because oftentimes these statistics are being used to say, oh, look, you know, here's a regime that sent women to universities. No, um, it's women um, just decided that since they can't actually enter the job market um, after they graduate, they should do everything else in order to um, change their own future, in order to uh, become the citizens that they are not allowed to become. And I think this, uh, their participation in the education uh, has been an act of resistance more more than anything else. Of course, and that's that's very much how I meant it, right? The contrast between what the kind right. of model of society is that the regime wants to impose and the way in which the society has actually evolved despite all of its attempts to stop that from happening. Right, but you'd be surprised how many people often use that very statistics to say, you misunderstand the regime, they're they are doing these things. Um, so to move on, I think one of the things that we are incapable of recognizing uh, in the West, because the regime looks the way it does, right? It's a, it, it has all the garb, all the disguises of a uh, religiously devout uh, leadership. Um, but, but what I oftentimes uh, refer to them as is, you know, Tony Sopranos in turbans and, you know, uh, robes. Um, you know, uh, the Sopranos have taken over Iran. It's really a, an economic mafia more than anything else. And um, the way the disguise works is that it makes everybody else, especially the West, think that these are Muslims, you know, out of respect for their religion, uh, and their tradition, uh, we need to stay out because we don't understand who they are, what they do, and um, we just, you know, uh, they are beyond our comprehension. So they've managed to kind of keep up the game, uh, keep up a good game, because uh, they look the way they do, they they dress as they do, um, and they do uh, embrace this, um, at least overtly, this mantle of religiosity. But at every opportunity, when you can kind of peel back the disguise, um, as fortunately uh, social media has given people the opportunity to do, um, you see them going to Europe, for instance, and their wives and daughters are without the hijab, right? Or, or there was um, another uh, posting that um, someone, I, I, I don't remember if it was a hacker or what, but um, had put on the internet of, um, some high-ranking official who was traveling in, you know, in Thailand or someplace with a with a lover um, who, you know, was dressed just like anybody else on the street and and nothing special. So I think um, they have failed to actually live up to the standards that they have set 
um, for religiosity, for piety, um, and and social media has revealed this duplicity on their part. And and um, and you know there is we should also not discount the fact that um, you know when Ayatollah Khomeini uh, gave his first speech arriving in Tehran, he was promising um, equality. He was promising that since they had gotten rid of a bad monarch who uh, had created all these poor, uh, impoverished uh, classes in the country, he was going to do the reverse, that there was going to be uh, economic equality um, and people were hearing all sorts of things, including that you know the prisons were going to become museums and that sort of thing. Um, so what ha what has happened is that now we have uh, a, a cast of uh, religious oligarchs in Iran um, who are there to uh, reap the benefits of being, you know, in high uh, official uh, positions, while their children and their families live in Canada, North America, Europe, um, according to the best lifestyles that you could possibly. Uh, fathom in these countries. So um, all of this um, has deeply undermined the societal belief that this is um, this is the regime that they voted for um, in 1979 when you know a national referendum was held. Um, people were going to were voted for Islamic Republic yes as the new form of government that they had chosen. Um, and they had, uh, you know, they have basically managed to disillusion people, and and renege on all the promises that they had initially made, especially on, you know, when it comes to uh, freedom of speech and you know dismantling prisons and um, and things are a hundred times worse than they had ever been uh, prior to the revolution. And I think that fundamentally, at the end of the day, has created a sense of huge distrust, uh, not just in the regime, but a disaffection from Islam in general, which explains the secular, you know, the uh, proclivities for secularity in, in the current uh, society of Iran. Um, but I think there is a class that remains conservative, that remains observant, that still supports the current movement and I think that's because they recognize if there is any hope for Islam to survive, and if there is going to be any hope for them to remain practicing Muslims in Iran, they have to make sure that they get past this regime that that completely uh, ruins their reputation and is just a bad mark on the the faith that they have. Um, you know, they practice and they believe in. Um, so let me understand or help me understand, help me understand in a little bit more detail the contrast between Iranian society in 1979 and 2022. Because as I take it from what you're saying, there are some similarities, right? Which is that actually uh, perhaps a significant number of Iranians or a majority of Iranians in 1979 did want to have more freedom and equality than they had had under the monarchy, and certainly a lot more freedom and uh, equality than they were eventually given by the theocratic regime. Um, so in a sense, that aspiration to uh, some amount of liberty and self-determination may be a constant. At the same time, it seems like there are at least two important differences. The first is that I take it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but statistics do seem to suggest that there has been a real uh, process of secularization. I mean, from uh, you know the size of the average family in 1979 to the educational level of women in society at the time, on average, with obvious exceptions, um, uh, to the, the, the number of times that people prayed. Uh, all of that seems to have changed quite a lot over the course of the last 50 years. And as we were talking about earlier, ironically, it seems to have changed towards a more secular uh, less devout uh, 
uh, uh, uh, society, towards a society in which women in certain ways play a bigger role because they have those degrees, they have uh, that education and so on that had been uh, uh, unavailable to them earlier. Uh, and, and then secondly, I suppose that uh, uh, the, the nature of your position to that institutionalized religion seems to have hardened. Um, I mean, this is something I sometimes think about in Italy, right? I mean, Italy is a country that is deeply shaped by Catholicism, but precisely for that reason, it's also a country where I know some of the most outspoken and sometimes I might even think immeasurate uh, anti-clericalists, right? Because if you're growing up in a country in which the church has holds so much power, um, your sort of resistance to that uh, power and your disdain for it uh, is going to be even more intense if you reject it. And and it seems like that's sort of a change. I, obviously, there's big differences between the role of Catholicism in, in Italy at any point and the role that Islam plays in Iran today. But it seems like uh, something like that uh, kind of change has uh, happened in Iran 50 years ago. Well, 50 years ago, even people who perhaps were not that devout, even people who perhaps were somewhat skeptical of Khomeini, um, you know, were perhaps religious at some level, um, had goodwill towards those ideas. And now, after 50 years of theocratic rule, have become sort of more outspokenly anti clerical or have become uh, a more resolute in the rejection of any kind of religious influence in society. Um, that's what I'm piecing together from this conversation, but is that a fair way of um, characterizing the contrast between what Iranian society was like 50 years ago and what it is now? Or, or, or you know, how, how would you characterize that contrast? How, how can we understand the change that has occurred in Iranian society over the course of the last half century? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So um, there are two key ideas that we should engage with. One is that the now that we look back in retrospect, the most important difference between the Iranian society or the society uh, that that seems to be anti-regime now and the one that was anti-regime and protesting on the streets in 1978 and 1979 is that the previous one was politically, ideologically, I should say, motivated and this one isn't, um, which in some ways I think speaks to the deep democratic, the far deeper democratic nature of the current one, as opposed to the previous one. So it, the two driving forces of the 1978 and 1979 movement um, were the religious conservatives led by primarily Khomeini uh, on, one, on the right, and then a medley of uh, leftist, communist, socialist, and religious uh, communists, you know, Islamic communists on the other side. And, and these two forces were in a constant state of competition for power, for legitimacy, for recognition. And at some point, I think the decision came, how it happened, I think it was a, a, an organic and natural process, that, you know, let Khomeini um, overthrow the Shah and then we can sort out, you know, who should be in power later. But the reality is that you either had a very communist left on the, le on, on the left uh, to choose from ideologically or a right. And there was really nothing much in between. Um, in fact, if there was something in between, it was still the women that were... Uh, even in 1979, with demanding for democratic and civil liberties. And I think that's what has kept um, women in the position of you know, leadership of the current movement, because they have this history of having um, been the people who have been uh, asking for democratic rights, demanding their democratic rights, even as early as March 8th of 1979. So you know, two weeks, three weeks after the Iranian revolution beca became triumphant and Khomeini returned to Iran in February of 1979, um, women took to the streets in major cities, especially in Tehran, saying that they were not going to accept the hijab, the mandatory dress code. And this is two, three weeks after um, Khomeini has returned. He is now either the most beloved figure or the most feared figure 
in the country. And, and so um, it, even at that moment, it is the women who dare take to the streets and who dare say, we didn't uh, participate in a revolution in order to go back. So, so it is women who are resisting the oncoming of what they sense to be a reactionary uh, you know, future for them. Um, what is very different now is that, of course, it's the same Iran, pretty much you know, the same people. But the difference is that there is no uh, ideology driving. There is no left and right. And what has brought people together is the desires for the very fundamental secular democratic ideals that, um, that every democratic revolution in the world um, has known of. And I think in some ways, George Washington and you know, the founding fathers of the United States have best captured um, you know, in their writings um, from you know, the late 1770s. Um, and, and those sentiments are very well captured in the song Baroye, which became very famous. You know, the, you know, the singer who then, who sang this song saying, we are uh, out on the streets, we want this movement for um, our women, our sisters, our mothers to be free, to dress as they wish. We, you know, we are conducting this movement for having the right to um, walk our dogs on the street because, you know, you religious uh, institutions are have issued an edict that, you know, we can't have dogs because dogs are considered dirty. So it, when you take that apart, you realize that there is no ideology this time. It's just the fundamental desire to live what people call a normal life. And I that's why I put so much more faith in this than I ever have in any previous movement, and particularly in 1979, that in some ways, all those that were being driven by, by you know, parties and organizations were bound to be failed if, if their direction was democracy. And this one, I think, understands that, that these are the fundamental uh, pillars of a democratic life. The other thing that I think is worth considering, um, thinking about why the Iranian society wishes um, and is so determined to become secular, is that the real revolution in Iran began in 1906 with the constitutional revolution. And the tension then was also the tension between the secularists inside Iran and the religious clergy um, there, and it, it has been an ongoing strife for over a hundred years. And I think what happened was that, that the clergy who had been on the scene, who had been um, resisting and refusing to allow Iran to, be, to have a, a constitutional, uh, a real constitutional order, um, finally won in 1979, came to power, the nation had that experience. And now, you know, that that ongoing rivalry is over because they lost. They had the power. They couldn't deliver what they had promised. And now that, you know, 100 plus year movement has come to fruition. And this time, the constitutionalists of so many centuries, you know, so many decades ago, um, finally are seeing, you know, the day. Um, fascinating. So, so, so going back to 1979, uh, your argument is that, you know, there was this mass resistance movement uh, uh, to the monarchy, but it was fundamentally split. But what they could agree on, as is often the case for opposition movements, is we want to get rid of the Shah, we want to get rid of the powers that be at the moment. But there was just all along this fundamental split about what should come after between an effectively communist left and uh, an Islamist right. Um, today, that doesn't seem to be the case, so that you have a regime and then you have an opposition, which despite, I'm sure, all kinds of ideological shades and all kinds of shades and how exactly they feel about religion or about Islam, uh, just says, hey, we want to get rid of this oppressive theocratic regime and we want many more 
ordinary liberties for people to lead their lives as they wish, to choose themselves whether they want to wear the hijab or not, to 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 be able to walk the dogs in the street for women, obviously, to have equal rights in the society and 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 so on and so forth. What today is the sort of sociology of who supports the regime and who opposes it? Um, so, uh, you know, obviously, uh, there are the people who are in power and who want to preserve the power. I understand that there's a big economic system uh, of uh, of domination. And so, uh, you know, people who are profiting from their political connections or from their political power for economic gain, presumably want to preserve the system, or, a lot, or at least a lot of them. There's a large number of people employed by the revolutionary guards and by other parts of a security state who, suppose, who presumably have a vested interest in preserving regime. What about other people? I mean, there must be some very conservative milieus, some very religious milieus, uh, perhaps more rural areas. I don't know. You know, who else are the supporters of a regime who, who who don't want to see it go? What determines whether somebody in Iran today is sympathetic to the to the opposition, sympathetic to the protests, or whether they are sympathetic to uh, to the regime, even at this late stage? Right. Um... So, you know, it's it's very hard to know this accurately um, because there is no polling uh, in Iran. There is no access to public opinion in Iran. Um, but I think what seems very clear is that even really conservative people in Iran who continue to be practicing Muslims and des and desire to remain so believe that they don't want to be represented represented by this regime that somehow this regime has corrupted the idea uh, of uh, piety and uh, spirituality that uh, religion represents for them Islam represents for them and I think, um, and I think they recognize that there is a um, certain degree of corruption that, again, you know, somehow mars and uh, stains um, the notion that, you know, here, these are the representatives of God on earth. Um, so I think, you know, they certainly their own supporters continue to support them. And, and certainly I can imagine that there are... Uh, you know, uh, other caste uh, within the Iranian society, other uh, layers, um, you know, maybe in the rural areas. Um, although, you know, there there has been so much water shortage and, um, and other economic issues that, uh, especially in the past five or 10 years, uh, some of the peoples who have taken to the streets have been from the rural areas, have been from um, the places we had never uh, seen uprisings in. And, you know, and there has been such great mismanagement that the lack of water, the lack of other, you know, fundamental uh, infrastructure has driven them to the streets. But um, as far as the popularity of this movement and the anti-regime sentiment in Iran is concerned, you just need to look at where these protests have taken place in order to recognize this isn't what we have seen in Iran before. For instance, in Khomeini, which is the birthplace of Ayatollah Khomeini, the founder of the Islamic Republic, protesters set Khomeini's home, childhood home on fire. The, you have to recognize that these were sacred spaces that that people went to as pilgrims to worship to that that you know protesters um, are protesting in in the cities and then you know basically defiling and and destroying there have been numerous uh protests in the city of Qom, which is basically the shiite capital of the world you know, these are all seminaries and, you know, you don't go to Qom unless you are a committed, uh, you know, Muslim who wants to study uh, Shiism. Um, there have been protests there. There have been pro protests in Mashhad, um, which is another hugely conservative city. Another 
uh, I think, important indicator is that for the past several weeks, people were saying that there's no way that the bazaar, that basically the major marketplace and business businesses of Iran would join. Well, what do you know? You know, in the past two weeks, the bazaar also joined. And, you know, for at least a couple of days, the majority of the shops in all bazaars throughout the country were shut down. And what did the regime do? They, they took these red paint and whatever business was shut down, they marked. You know, we're we're watching you. We're seeing you. So I I think just by kind of doing a reconnaissance of um, the geography of the protests, you can see that in places where there have no protests before, there are protests this time around. That's that's fascinating. Um... Let me shift a little bit from Iran to the reaction around the world. Um, an acquaintance of mine asked me early on during uh, the protests a question which I tried to answer as best I could, but I didn't feel I could uh, entirely give justice to, which is, why don't people seem to care? Why in the United States, in Europe, in so many countries around the world, isn't this amazingly brave and, and big protest movement attracting as much attention, as much admiration, as much support as it should? What does it tell us about us that this is not on, on the front page uh, every day? Well, you know, we can we can get negative and say, you know, we're apathetic, you know, um, you know, be self-deprecating. That's not what I want to do. Um, what I think is really most important to recognize is that when we talk about Iran sanctions, we're not just talking about something that happened to Iranians inside Iran. We're also talking about a, a firewall that was created in terms of public interest in the West, in terms of the uh, intellectual engagement on the part of Western intelligentsia, in the issue of Iran, because it appeared that it was too distant, too exotic, and too unknown, or too difficult to be explored and known because, because again, of the Shiite disguise, of the religious disguise. And, and for many, many years, we have been very, as, as Americans, as intellectuals, we've been very daunted um, at the notion of even broaching the subject of Iran as an intellectual uh, subject matter to engage with. In fact, you know, tomorrow is the, um, you know, marks the anniversary of the passing of Christopher Hitchens. And I think, you know, of all the people whom I, whose absence uh, I feel the most is Hitchens' absence, because he was the only one um, who was never afraid to uh, take on the mullahs and also take on, you know, the issue of the importance of, uh, you know, uh, the, the inevit inevitability of change in Iran. In fact, he gave a talk, I think, 10 years ago or 12 years ago, just before he died, that a revolution was coming to Iran because the generational uh, change was going to make it inevitable. So I think, um, I think we have been reluctant to uh, challenge some of the notions that I think, in fact, the regime has been peddling to, to the Western public opinion. One has been, you know, there is a reform and hardliner in Iran, and uh, the best choice is to help enable the reform movement. Well, you know, the reform movement ended for Iranians in 2009. But still, you know, there are Western intellectuals that are still diehard, uh, you know, followers of the reform hope and idea. Um, it, it, there, the, another notion is that, you know, if if you lift the sanctions, you know, Iranians won't be on the streets. If you hadn't, if the U.S. hadn't pulled out of the JCPOA, um, you know, the protesters wouldn't be on the streets. That so much of what we're seeing as if is simply an expression of the economic difficulties of the or the U.S. meddling or unmeddling in the issue of Iran, and I think these are um, all opinions that somehow have been filtered through to us, you know, partially by 
I think, misguided academics, um, but partially also by the regime itself, to convince us that um, either we should stay out because they're impossible to understand or comprehend because it, they're a different tradition, a different culture, a different religion, or um, that um, the politics are too complicated and the best thing we can do, or the regime was too ubiquitous, and the best thing we could do was to help you know, a faction from within the regime, which was the reformist, win. Um, and, and I think that was just a very good game of good cop, bad cop that the regime played on us for over 20 years. Um, so I think the best thing we, as uh, especially uh, intelligentsia in America can do is to begin to see how we have thought about Iran in all the wrong ways and how we need to understand that if we are going to protect democracy in America, strengthen democracy in America, uh, we need to care about democracy elsewhere in the world. Because any place where democracy loses, democracy everywhere weakens for everyone else. What concretely should the United States government, should the governments of European Union countries uh, do in order to help preserve that hope of freedom in Iran, and what can ordinary people do? What can listeners to this to this podcast do to you know give concrete form to the solidarity that I'm sure uh, most or all of them feel uh, with with the people protesting for freedom in the streets of Tehran and other cities at the moment? Well, I think um, you know in 1979, I I wasn't here, I was in Iran, but I hear that. Um, when the hostage crisis happened um, and people in America were really concerned, they were you know, tying yellow uh, ribbons around uh, their trees in front of their homes and wearing them on their lapels just to uh, make sure that everybody saw that they remembered the hostages. Well, you know, um, the protesters uh, deserve that sort of attention. We need to really recognize that the health of democracy um, in our country depends on the health of democracy in other parts of the world. And that, you know, just like Zelensky says, that Ukrainians are fighting on behalf of democracy in Ukraine, we also have to understand that Iranians are rising up on behalf of democracy for all of us. And therefore, you know, let's keep them you know, let's hang flags, let's, let's you know, um, uh, tie a ribbon, but let's make sure that they become part of the fabric of our consciousness, um, hopefully in the same way that Ukraine is. And I do, by the way, see these two events uh, as very much interconnected, obviously, you know, for um, not just uh, morally, but also because, um, you know, Ali Khamenei and Vladimir Putin um, are each other's best friend and supporters at the moment. Um, and then I think there is a slew of recommendations that um, various think tanks in this country have made, which includes um, you know, a large uh, gamut of ideas, starting with, you know, let's make sure Iranians have access to the internet and the regime can't turn it off, which means that we as the as Americans should invest in getting you know reception stations to the Iranians inside Iran somehow you know provide it to them because you know Starlink people now have could possibly have access to Starlink but they they need the reception station so let's turn that into um, a funded project where we do send in um, the reception stations um, that's one huge step and then um, I think there are a slew of other possibilities that you know so many others talk about you know the supreme leader isn't on on the list of persona non grata it hasn't been sanctioned yet um you know um it, it, iran is aiding uh, russia providing <clears throat> russia with drones so that that really changes the calculation from what iran is doing to its own people to iran participating in you know in an illegitimate war um, and I think that gives us, as you know, just the possibilities of enforcing international law and and other pressures on Iran. Roya Hakakan, thank you so much for coming to our podcast. Thank you so much, Yasha. I enjoyed it.